Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let there be strange operations of the God of matter. Somebody shout it. 
Aremana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let there be strange operations of the God of matter. together as one with praise thanksgiving and worship to you the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the one in whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named the one before whom we give reverence the one before whom we bow down the one before whom we recognize as the source of our being be glorified be honored be praised at this time of our communion and fellowship may the eyes of our understanding be enlightened in the knowledge of your dear son may we recognize the glory of the riches of your inheritance within your saints and the full extent of the power which you deployed when you raised your son Jesus Christ from the dead and appointed him over all principality power dominion and throne and has delegated that headship to your church who is now the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We thank you, Father. In Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, do something for me. Greet as many people as you can. I honor the Christ in you all. The Lord is good. God is love and he can only be himself. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Lord. We have entitled this time of prayer and asceticism. We have entitled this time Transfigured in the Glory. Amen. Lent is a 40 day period, Amen. which is a number indicating a journey, Amen. a transition, Amen. or even uh, an exodus. The time of prayer that we spend on a daily basis and that we exercise in community as we have several prayer groups that are praying all over the nation Amen. at different coordinated times. This devotion, this exercise of the faith of God will not leave you indifferent. Because whatever you do for another affects you. Amen. That's why service serves you well. Amen. When you truly minister on behalf of the Lord, you are ministered to. Amen. The Spirit of God energizes you. And as a result of that, you can minister not by human strength, Amen. but by the human in synergy with the divine. Amen. So our activities house the activities of God Amen. because it's a collaboration. Amen. It's a partnership. It's a shared task. You know, whenever we talk about commitment, people lose their enthusiasm. But the truth is, we are participants of the divine nature. Amen. And God is continually loving you and I. So what would being heirs of God's nature look like? It would look like what you see in the eternal Son of God. It looks like kenosis. That's why Paul would say, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. And he's referring to our phronema, which is not only our vision, or worldview, it is the attitude on how we live that worldview. It is, it is improper to think we are just here to receive a repertoire of lessons and teachings that simply uh, fill our intellect. That's not why we're here. Amen. Jesus Christ came to minister life. Amen. And life is lived within a specific context. So what you experience on a day-to-day -day basis and what you would say is ordinary, that is the vantage point for you uh, to experience this life and you meet people you encounter people who become the beneficiaries of your transformation Glory be to God. Amen. So, 
just as how um, every believer is consecrated as a saint, every believer is called to live as a minister. Remember that on Mount Tabor, Peter, James, and John witnessed the transfiguration. Peter wanted to build three booths there. One for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Christ. But the voice of the Father interrupted his stupidity and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I will please listen to him. And he was overwhelmed. He fell prostrate. The hand of Christ came and touched him. It was filled with awe and reverence. And then he saw Jesus only. Uh, God is restoring reverence to his church. Which is God's knowledge of what is holy. God's knowledge of what is special. Of what is valued. Of what is uh, sanctified. Beyond the ordinary. Beyond the common. But immediately, as they saw Jesus only, Jesus let them know not to share what they have experienced with anyone till after his resurrection from the dead. Which shows us that the transfiguration was a preview of the resurrection. It was a preview of the healing, the salvation, the liberation of the human nature. So what Christ Jesus unveiled at Mount Tabor is man as God intended. Man is supposed to be the expression of God, not just housed within his human nature but through his morphe morphe is the greek term that speaks about the outer expression of human life the outer expression of human life your mode of being that's what transformation is and in second peter chapter 1 peter uses that experience, that encounter he had on Mount Tabor, he uses it to explain his confidence in every son and daughter of God becoming a first-hand witness to experience the glory of God for themselves. Because the one who is the source of that radiating light will cause that revelation to dawn in our hearts. And once it dawns in our hearts, it's, it's that form of light which pierces through obscurity and leads to a new day. So when that happens, our human nature functions as God intended. This is a holistic and therapeutic view of salvation. Amen. Not transactional, but transformational. Amen. And I think this needs to be re-emphasized. Because we thank God for the Reformation. The Reformation rectified a certain extreme which had entered into the church in the West. But the pendulum effect shows us that in attempting to correct a course that has gone to one side of the ditch, many times they leave that side of the ditch and go to the opposite side of the ditch. I think in my humble uh, review of the Protestant Re Reformation, that's what has happened. Well, people, uh, people have viewed salvation as transactional 
from the Protestant background, from the evangelical background. And there is a reason for this. The reason was, you know, the, the magisterial reformers were attempting to reappraise Paul in his understanding of salvation. And what they did is that they centered Paul on justification. So, to me, this is not a proper evaluation of Paul. So to them, they looked at the Apostle Paul's teachings and they saw justification as the center of all Paul's system of truth. So they interpreted everything about Paul focused primarily on justification by faith. Did Paul teach on justification by faith? Absolutely. Was it the center of his teaching? Well, not necessarily. He centers his teaching on what we would call union with Christ. Because if you focus on what Jesus Christ uh, came to do, it's possible that you end up with the transactional mode of salvation because you're focusing on him as a means to an end. And anytime you focus on Jesus as a means to an end, there's not, there's not transformation. So his reason for doing that was on the Roman Catholic end, they had focused so much on uh, a works soteriology that he was attempting to bring people back to an understanding of grace uh, without superstition because the church had given into a lot of superstitious beliefs. Let me just mention that again because... The Pentecostal charismatic world in our day is just like 16th century Roman Catholic Europe. That's what Africa, the, the charismatic church in Africa is like. Because the charismatic Pentecostal church in Africa uh, builds most of its practices on superstition. Superstition is what people use as authority when there is no knowledge. So when there is no knowledge, people build on superstition. And superstition is upheld by fear. So a, a superstitious fear of the adversary, ignorance of our authority, of our sonship rights, of whose we are and who we are. You know, you, you take out that one factor, many churches have no basis of ministering anymore. They've completely missed the mark when it comes to the mission of the church. They've established their own mission altogether. And I know this offends people, but it should. It should offend you uh, how the truth is not what motivates most people. Because I've devoted my life to teach this gospel, and we've done so by establishing churches. There's a... The, there is a price to pastor churches. There's a price to oversee churches. See, most people who are preaching today, they've all, they've all uh, retired from pastoring and retired from overseeing people. They just host conferences or have online programs. Why do you think that is? Because... There's a challenge that comes with teaching people and prepare for your best and, and, and people come and because you have been speaking for so long, they don't really value what you're saying. You know, you can't, you can't hide that from someone who has been preaching for 20 years. And then 
when you take the gospel to ministers now. Ministers behold the truth, they see it, but then they say, well, if we preach this, we will not have the kind of influence we used to have. It, it, won't, it, won't, it won't lead to people uh, putting in certain offerings in the church. It won't lead to more people coming, so on and so forth. Now, that is the state the church was in, in Europe, in the 16th century. That's a church without transformation. A transformative church is a church that is willing That people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Willingness is a sign of God's power operative in the believer. Willingness. As we avail ourselves to God, then we experience His ability. You know? So, you know, Brother Martin Luther and the other reformers, they did what they did and were grateful for that episode in church history. However, however, it created in many an understanding that salvation is just a transaction that we look at Jesus as a means to an end. What he came to do. But he's living within us. Amen. And we are living within him. Amen. He didn't come for an episode and then ascend into heaven and excarnate. No, there's a man in the Godhead. And we are fully represented in Him. And so the transformative is a mystical thing. Because it's not something we can humanly produce. In fact, grace in itself is always going to be transformative and is always going to lead to transcendence. Why? Because the moment you're speaking of grace, you have to look beyond yourself. People reject grace because many times they're offended at the notion that God saves you, gives, supplies that which pertains to salvation without your contribution to it. So we're not saved by good works. But this is the thing. When we experience this grace, when we awaken to it, our mode of being is one where to be our authentic selves, we have to live beyond self. Remember what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, that... Um, Thus we judge that if one died for all, therefore, how, how many died? All. all died. Jesus Christ is a consummate man. Amen. He died on behalf of all whom he represented. Amen. And the next verse says, therefore... No man, let me paraphrase, no man for whom Christ Jesus died can authentically claim to live for himself. You're in a, a state of illusion. You're in a mistaken identity if you want to claim to live as an independent self. There is no such thing as an independent self. To be in Christ means you find yourself in another. 
Eternal life is not necessarily a commodity Jesus imparts unto you. Jesus Christ himself is eternal life. Amen. And to experience life is to know Christ. Amen. Knowing Christ would mean yet you live beyond yourself. You're not selfish. You're not motivated by the things that uh, draw those who are unawakened, those who are unreached, those that are yet pre-believers. We prefer to call them. So salvation refers to God restituting on a therapeutic level. Amen. Our human nature to be responsive to God, to commune with God, to vehicle God, to bear and manifest God. That's, that's the, the, the fruit of being saved. And when you look at the tenses of salvation, we are saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. Romans, the 12th chapter. So, St. Peter spoke of the transfiguration of Christ as a model of soteriology. That what you saw in Christ at the transfiguration is going to happen within your heart. They said, he said, our testimony of Christ, which is born witness in the four Gospels is, is given as a lamp to shine in a dark place until the day star that orb of light which dissolves all darkness and introduces a new day Amen. will arise in your heart. Amen. So that means none of us were appointed to have a second-hand experience of Christ. Each of us, <laughs> each of us is appointed to have a first-hand experience to be eyewitnesses of the glory of Christ. And that will be the dealings of Christ within you in the divine indwelling what follows as a result what does transformation look like does it mean uh, we just have halos radiating from our head or does it just mean uh, it's just perpetually laying hands on the sick well to most charismatics that's the only form of ministry that they know. But remember what transformation means. To have your outward mode of living changed. Amen. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Beseech is a very strong term. It means I place you under a sacred invocation. <laughs> I beseech you, brethren. It's an invocation. When someone calls upon God and 
ask God to bear witness that he has told you something. It is a statement made with the highest urgency. What's our highest urgency? For us by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. So that sacred invocation that Paul places us under what is it meant to acknowledge? To acknowledge God's mercy? Which is exhibited toward us? Now the next statement is very interesting. That you present your bodies... The body is the outward form, the outward mode of our human existence. But that we present it as a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, there was no such thing. <laughs> All sacrifices under the ministry of condemnation were certified as dead before they were offered to God. Especially if, if they were animals. But now we're living in a different epoch. And there's only one sacrifice. So to present your bodies to God in view of His mercy as a living sacrifice, it would, mean, it would mean that by the mercies of God, acknowledge that your body is taken up by Christ's glorification and presented to the Father holy and acceptable in His sight. What is this? It is your reasonable service. Amen. Which shows us the following. The service which is acceptable to God has to be configured from the mind. Amen. Christians are too superficial. They're caught up in shallow religious activities without conviction. To walk with Christ, because Christ lives in us, but yet we do walk with Him. Amen. We are called to walk in this newness of life, Amen. which means there's a new way of being human. You can't claim to receive the gospel. And then there's nothing which distinguishes you from those that are yet dwelling in the darkness of their own ignorance. Of those who are consumed by false ego. You ought not to be the same as them. There is a differentiation. And it is that differentiation that shows forth the praises of God. And draws men into his marvelous light. So there is a radical mind shift in this model of salvation, which is transfiguration, it's transformational. It's not that, okay, I believe that I received Jesus and we go and sin our brains out. Because that's not who you are. That's a mistaken identity. 
we're not looking at it transactionally. We're not also looking at it legalistically. We're looking at it holistically. Awakening to Christ as your salvation, knowing Christ as your one and only life, will heal your heart of being carried away by, by fear and insecurity and anxiety. Still here? So there's a radical mind shift that is required to live this new way of being human. Paul says, I place you under divine invocation that you are to acknowledge the mercies of God. Acknowledge the love of God that came on rescue mission. To take us out of our own plight. To, to deliver and liberate us from our pitiful plight. And acknowledge that in Christ Jesus, your bodies, your, the outward form of your humanity is presented to God as holy acceptable which is which is italicized meaning was added so this is your reasonable service it is your service rendered unto God to acknowledge that Christ in his glorified humanity has presented you as holy to his father So this life we live in the body is meant to be the outward mode which is a vessel for Christ's revelation. Your, your, your body, your physical frame is to be a vessel for Christophanic revelation. People are, ought to see Christ in His love in his gentleness in his compassion in his patience in his meekness in his love in his joy in his peace in his goodness through you it's who you are And be not conformed to this world. The term world is aeon, meaning an age or an epoch, which is characterized by certain trends which become the culture of a given period of time. So ages are characterized by certain trends Amen. Amen. which predominate that age. Yeah. In Paul's day, even though Jesus Christ uh, had fulfilled the law and the prophets by his death on the cross, they were in a transitional generation. The Jews didn't know what had happened. They were in a state of denial. They were in a state of cognitive dissonance. They didn't want to just accept <laughs> that they had rejected the Messiah. So for 40 years, there was a special outreach that was carried out to them. And during that time, many believers got disheartened during the 40 years. 
because the Jews were not, many of them were not showing that they wanted to believe. And they had the temple, they had the nation, they had the political power, they had the advantages. So believers were like, I mean, what's the point? It's the reason for the book of Hebrews. Many brethren were going back to Judaism. And so the author of Hebrews has to show them uh, the new and better covenant. How Christ supersedes all that preceded Him. And that Christ is the consummate word of the Father. So He told them in their day, do not become conformed. To the age in which you live. Conformed. Which means to be molded. To be configured. In the mold of conventional thought patterns. So every age. Exists. Because people think in a particular way. So that age is perpetuated by a way of thinking. When we speak about a way of thinking, we're not just speaking about uh, random thoughts. No, we're speaking about that which becomes the core of your mind, that which is the vital principle animating how a person reasons. And that will make up your outward experiences it's your it's your outlook that determines the outcome of your outward experiences irrespective if you claim to be a christian the configuration of your thoughts make up your life Make up your life. Amen. And so to the to the brethren living in Paul's time, they believed that God lived in the temple in Jerusalem. That was the main characteristic of their religion. God dwelled in the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> so they had to undergo a radical mind shift. Do not be conformed to the age The Lord was now inhabiting them. And they couldn't even, they couldn't even live in view of God's mercies, except they first recognized that the the Lord in His glorified humanity had taken up their bodies and presented their bodies holy and acceptable to God. So He said, this is your reasonable service. As you begin to first acknowledge this, he said, there will be transformation. Paul says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He does not say, stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh and then you will walk in the spirit. The reason why Christians are in the flesh all the time is that they think that walking in the spirit would mean that they have no aspect of flesh in them. They will have no, no, form, of, uh, no form of of temptation or no form 
of trial and then they'll be walking in the spirit. No, you're reversing the order. It is as you walk in the spirit that you will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. It is as in view of the mercies of Christ that you acknowledge that you are presented in the living sacrifice. That your bodies are presented in Him, acceptable and holy under God. This is your reasonable sacrifice. Or your reasonable service, rather. You're learning to configure your mind in agreement with God. Until your mind is in agreement with God, you will never experience what He says is yours. Amen. Never. You will continue struggling when it comes to your sanctification walk. Because you, people generally f formulate theologies in their mind to try and explain their experiences. So people say, oh, it's the devil's fault. The devil made me do it. Is the devil. It's the work of the devil. Indeed. Or they will say, no, it is an indwelling sin nature. It's an indwelling sin nature that is still there. Well, I have a problem with that. Sin is never described as being a nature. If you mean by that that sin corrupts the human nature, I understand the terminology. But not that sin is a, is a nature foreign to human nature. It's still there? If you believe you have a sin nature, you will sin by faith. You see, you have to undergo a radical mind shift. Irrespective of... <laughs> Of what your prayer life may look like. Because many people want to approach prayer life as if it is a divine manipulation. <laughs> I've put in one hour of prayer every day for the past 40 days. I've put in two hours of prayer every day for the past 40 days. And because of that, something must change. Not necessarily. First of all, God doesn't recognize chronological time. And with God, it's not how long, but how well. Amen. You will find on many occasions, uh, God focuses primarily on quality before quantity follows. That's why if you come to this church, you better be ready to sit appropriately and give your attention. Amen. Because we are ministering to you quality. We never approach the pulpit with a nonchalant attitude. There's always preparation. 
we, we honor our office before the Lord Amen. in prayer and in study Amen. on behalf of God's people. Amen. So, if those who minister prepare their hearts before the Lord and receive from God to give to God's people, it will require the same on behalf of God's people Amen. to receive at the same dimension of quality. Jesus said something strange. Jesus called a series of woes upon cities where he had ministered and said, had the signs been performed in you been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have still been standing to this day. You see, Carpanaum is where Jesus had one of the outposts of his ministry. And Christ called down woe upon Carpanaum. So, being exposed to revelation from God sometimes is dangerous. Because if you don't properly respond to it, you'll be held accountable for everything you've received and everything that you heard and everything you had the opportunity that others didn't have. You need a radical mind shift. You need to learn to think differently. You need a Christian frame of mind. You see, so many who profess to be Christian don't have a Christian frame of mind. They're not thinking like Christians. They're still thinking according to the zeitgeist. The ghost of the age. It's a German word. The spirit of the age is what molds their minds. What molds their activities. What molds their agendas. It's, it's, what they're hearing in church, they're just saying that, no, come, come have what souver. Could you me beni? What, what do you call that? Those are not even Christian terminologies. That's superstition. So even though you're still... <laughs> coming to this church and you're being taught the gospel... You know, you have a Christian frame of mind. Could you, Uvu, my wood, keep us be on the top? No, you don't even have a Christian frame of mind. It means even your worldview, your worldview is still pagan. Your worldview is not yet Christianized. Your mind configuration is what constructs your experiences of life. The reason why you're struggling is that the spirit of the age is still molding your thought patterns. That's why. When you're coming to church, you're just coming to church. No, it's true. Your mind configuration constructs your experiences in life. Today, when Christians face trials, they ask themselves, what is not working? What did I do wrong? Or they say, who has done this to me? That's not a Christian frame of mind. The apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ himself told us that we will face contradictions. We will face tests. We will face trials. 
But unfortunately, because many Christians don't have a Christian frame of mind, they think something is wrong. So they experience defeat when they have victory in the midst of all those contradictions. It's possible to have <laughs> the same information but not the same concepts. In the introduction of the book Fathered by God, I make a statement. When you hold the a different image regarding a word other than that which was the intent of the author. Every time you're using that word, although it's the same word, you're using it with a misconception. So it's one thing to define a word, it's another thing to conceive the definition of the word. That's why... That's what I mean by the difference between information and awareness. They're not one and the same. I'm sure if I were to inspect your notes, I wouldn't recognize what you're writing down. Because you're not just writing what you hear me say, you write what you think you heard me say. So your mind configuration is the filter that even allows you to hear. You see, our Lord even said that uh, it will be measured unto you according to how you hear. How you hear becomes a measure of what you receive. What's the difference between someone (laughs) who has and another who has not? It's not that God never gave. One heard and another did not. The difference between the haves and the have-nots in the economy of God is that there are those who heard and there are those who heard not. Just like what I'm teaching now. Look at how you're looking at me. Let's stand to our feet. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Is the same word, metamorpho. How are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. There are new thoughts that have to be received and configured by your mind before there are new experiences that will emerge in your life. Oh, Father, we thank you for a new way of seeing. We thank you in this time, eternal Father, that there is an in Christ configuration of our minds according to your gospel. To see and perceive as you intended. Thank you for that transition from the old to the new. We're not going back. 
to that which was a shadow, we're now walking in the substance. And our thoughts constitute our walk. And we acknowledge in view of your great mercies that we are in Christ. And that he presents us to you holy and acceptable. And this is our act of worship and service brought to you by our minds. Uh, We reason into agreement with you. We reason into concord with you. And we are able to walk together because we agree together. We thank you, Father, that we are not molded by the spirit of this age. Uh, we're, we're not molded by the lust of the flesh. Amen. We're not molded by the lust of the eyes. Amen. We're not molded by the pride of life. Amen. We thank you that we are, con- we are, we are conjoined to Christ. Amen. And that our outer mode of being is transformed. Our minds, our bodies, our outward life is a vehicle for Christophanic revelation. To make the love of God visible, the peace of God, the joy of God, the kingdom of God. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we praise you and we glorify your holy name. Uh, We thank you for this transformation. Thank you that our mind is being renewed, reconfigured, reconstructed. Blessed is your holy name. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Glory to God. You may be seated for one moment. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. One who understands that his giving will avert calamity in someone else's life. Because that giving will go into expressions of God in terms of His love, in terms of His gospel. And when someone understands that in the motive of His giving, that's the kind of giver God rejoices in. See, you can never buy what's already yours. God has already given you His favor. But do you know how to respond favorably from the favor of God? There was one particular Passover. God gave me a tremendous revelation. When I saw my children prepare the Resurrection Sunday offerings, at home, I had given them money. Say, well, this is yours. You do what you want with it. They took it and just put it in the envelopes. And the Lord asked me, did you see what your children did? I said, yeah. He said, that's the secret of walking in favor. And I said, Lord, if I'm, ha- if I'm going to have to share that, you're going to have to help elaborate they are aware that they are giving what doesn't belong to them. They're giving their father's money. It doesn't touch them. They're giving their father's money. (laughs) 
And so they're responding favorably to favor. Amen. They know there's more of where that came from. Can I say this with you? If you despise the favor of God evident on someone else's life, you're depriving yourself of the same for you. So when you see people walking in the favor of God, men and women whom God has honored and has placed the seal of His Spirit upon them, you honor that. Because you despise it, you'll never receive it in your own life. You will never experience what you despise in another. Glory to God. Amen. Well, we have an opportunity to honor the Lord with our substance. Amen. And... I shared with you that we're going to Nairobi, Kenya. Amen. And I'm trusting the Lord for 12 partners who will help turn certain things that need to be done in the right direction. Amen. Well, we thank you, Father, that in your favor, you have given so that our hearts can become generous. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Blessed is your holy name. Amen. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This Sunday, we are coming pre-expectant. We're, we're coming with hearts prepared. We're coming with hearts that are responsive to God. Amen. Amen. Because we have a special miracle service this Sunday. Uh, I'm going to repeat that again. We have a special miracle service this Sunday. So we're combining both services. So we will be here 7.30, starting 7.30, and so that uh, we will have the miracle service and the Eucharist, Amen. and we will end whenever the Lord wants us to end. <laughs> so bless with all blessings. Amen. Hey, somebody celebrate! Jesus Christ is God's endorsement of His creation of matter, of silver and gold, of matter within creation to reveal the God of matter, to reveal the Lord of time and space, to reveal that we were sent from another world to be His ambassadors and represent Him in this one. Somebody shout it. Kila Aremana Yeah 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 Let there be strange operations of the God of matter